Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is Stephen Spector with you. And of course, as usual, uh, my guest, Rob Hirschfeld, who's always here. Uh, good day to you, Rob. Hello, Stephen. I always try to find a new way to, to introduce you because, you know, you're on every podcast. So we have Chris to do Walls. that. Chris Walls. You, you, got, you got, got to go all Chris Wall on me. That would be awesome. <laughs> so we have an interesting guest, and I'm excited because it's not anyone I've spoken to before, which always makes it really interesting. And uh, hopefully I get it right. He's the CEO and co-founder of a stealth startup called Macrometa, and his name is uh, Chaitan Venkatesh. Chaitan, I think I got it right. I think you nailed it. Uh, awesome. It's such a pleasure to be here. Hi, hi, Rob. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, uh, I've lived in different parts of the world, and I've probably heard my name pronounced in every single, you know, part of the world differently. Uh, and interesting fact about my name, depending on how you say it in different dialects of Chinese, it can either mean speeding bullet or boiled egg. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> I like speeding bullet. I would go with that one. <laughs> yes, I, I, I just don't know what the uh, pronunciation is. There's a very little minor difference, but I've been told. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. We're excited to have you, I, especially because you, you came across our radar talking about some of our favorite topics um, in, in, a, in a no, no prisoner, take no prisoners type of way. Um, and so I, I think we're going to have some fun digging in on edge and, and edge topics and um, the challenges, I think, that are in front of us. But before that, do you, can you give us some back? Your company's in stealth, so, so obviously, you know, we'll, we'll treat that as a wall garden. But yep. can you give us some background and, and what brings you into uh, edge and edge infrastructure as an interest area? Sure. Uh, you know, my background is I've been in data center software uh, on the infrastructure side of things for the past uh, 20 odd years. I've been a part of three startups uh, as a part of the founding team and, you know, started as an engineer uh, and, you know, went up that role through management, leadership, et cetera, was a CTO of, a, of one of my prior startups and then got more and more involved in the operational side of things. And, you know, that's where I really enjoyed uh, you know, what I thought, where I found myself and so sort of became more of a techno operations guy uh, and started to, you know, build and run companies with, with, with good teams. And I've been very fortunate that I worked with some really exceptional people. My journey to the edge really started a couple of years back uh, where, you know, it was interesting. I was working with a couple of our customers at that company and, you know, they were telecom operators as well as enterprise companies. And largely we started to see that the uh, pattern of traffic, which was, which has largely been cloud to client, you know, there were some, some subtle shifts in that traffic and you started to see a lot more client to cloud type traffic scenarios come up. And that's when, you know, it's, it occurred to me that should that pattern actually develop into something substantial that potentially the architectures of the last 30 years in client server that we've, managed to industrialize in this massive way in the hyperscale data centers are not going to serve us very well in this new world. And lo and behold, you have things like, you know, IOT and yeah, a, a lot of interesting, exciting frontier type applications that we're talking about today in AR, VR, gaming, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, those are very much taking that pattern of client to cloud traffic and, and, and exposing I think many gaps that exist in, in our thinking about what cloud is. And, right. and, you know, to me, edge is sort of, it starts as an extension of cloud, but it becomes far more important because it sits as an intermediary between what we call the cloud today and people and their applications and devices. And I think it's got a very important role in unlocking new things that were not possible before, uh, which I'd love to talk to talk about more uh, yes. through, the, through the podcast. Yeah, so you um, there's a couple, there's a huge number of things for us to unpack, right? The architectural model, the transition with cloud, um, you know, and what you know, and we'll get we'll get we'll get there. You know, we sort of to just ground people. I always like to ask, can you define what edge is? That's a great question, and you know, depending on the time of the day, I'd probably give you a different answer. <laughs> um, so I, I'd say that there, there today the edge is really there are three edges that we can talk about. There's the edge of the cloud, and to me, these are sort of metropolitan data centers uh, where there are, there's, there's compute, storage, and network infrastructure available, 
in largely urban dense areas. And I, I'm a big believer in this metropolitan edge because if you look at humanity, I think the statistic is 87% of all human beings live in an urban area today. Um, and that means that you know, 87% of human beings, their devices and their commerce happens in these urban dense areas. And the edge today where it's probably most real is, is in these metro uh, type data centers that you could potentially harness to uh, create new value for these types of uh, users because they're close to them, there's proximity and you, know, you can do interesting things. The second edge is very much inside where the telecom networks are and, and internet service providers are sort of evolving towards. And telecom providers, especially with things like 5G, you know, they now have the ability to actually, I think, play a very strategic role in redefining the cloud uh, where the cloud can be within their networks. A, a substantial portion of the value of what is what we call cloud can be un unclocked, unlocked within their networks. Historically, I, I, I think that they've not played a very smart role in, in being able to do that. And if you've sort of seen the rise of the cloud and you know, nobody could have predicted that they would grow so quickly in, in such prominence with such impact. A large part of that in my uh, you know, humble opinion is because the telecom players just absolutely did not realize the potential of what they were taking on and just became dumb, you know, bit pipe providers in that whole equation. So I think that that's the second edge, the radio access networks and the ability to put IT infrastructure in those places and enable edge applications. And then there's the fog edge or the device edge, you know, which is really, uh, you know, right at the end of that uh, pipe, which is the actual device itself. And you know that comes with, you know, and I think people tend to confuse the fog edge with everything else, uh, but that distinction is very important because the device itself has co comes with you know enormous constraints, uh, and and the kind of cloud computing you can offer on that device is is very very different from what you do with the two other edges that I described within the telecom network or in the metropolitan data center. So to me, these three pieces are the edge, uh, okay. and I tend to talk about what you can do with each of them. Uh, there's overlap between them, but there's also some very unique aspects of each of them uh, that make them uh, very complementary. Yeah, I, and I, I have mixed feelings about the term fog from that perspective <laughs> um, as, as a term for this. But um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back a little and have you clarify. So the, the terminus of the, of the device you, you were calling fog. So like the actual devices that collect or send it, the sensors, the headsets, uh, car is a weird one, so mm -hmm. this is why I, I'm, I'm drilling on it, because a car is, is in a lot of cases becoming a portable data center. Sure. Um, where, where does the car, a car, right, because car has 250 distinct sensor units, potentially with multiple servers and data information infrastructure. Um, do, you have a, do you have a sort of classification with, where that hybrid piece fits in? Yeah, you know, I think the car is probably more uh, emblematic of what I would call the device edge. It, it, because it ultimately is some sort of a gateway platform that has to sit over there and aggregate, you know, from across the plethora of sensors that sit over there. So, you know, I think once this sort of matures, the fog end of things, you know, uh, the, the, the IoT gateway or whatever that evolves into is really the device edge. And you'll have devices talking to them. So, you know, that sort of becomes the control plane and the data plane where you would, uh, right. you know, manage a discrete set of devices, you know, as a part of a and, car or something like that. And yet the, the and, and we, we we're using the term 5G without any, any grounding. So if, if you're new to edge, 5G is the next generation cell phone uh, technology and it has all these, um, these very disruptive things. We've, we've talked about this in some previous podcasts. So, I don't want to spend a lot of time just defining 5G for people, but, but do a little homework. 5G is important from an edge perspective. Um, one of the things about it is that it has the potential to avoid the aggregation points in your house or in your car, right? You could literally have devi devices in your fog edge that are talking directly to the 5G infrastructure and bypassing the, the house um, IoT gateway. Um, or you could have some weird hybrid of all these things. Is that, do you, do you see that as a, as part of this architecture? Yeah, I think so. Because w one of the issues with IOT gateways is that, you know, are we going to end up with sort of a fragmentation and multiple gateways for different sorts of things in our homes and our cars? 
uh, or will they be sort of fully managed services that a, you know, a particular vendor provides us? And I think that, and it's not clear to me whether a new class of vendor is gonna evolve was gonna be that aggregation point or it, it, you just get a better end user experience, for example, if it's sort of a managed service where every service somehow figures out what's the best way to do that in a hybrid fashion. Not, not very clear on where that ends up being, but I think user experience and, uh, and, and simplicity and all of those pieces, because we're talking about, you know, potentially a, an explosion of devices over here like we've never seen. I mean, today we're used to five, six devices that collapse in a cell, fo cell phone but if you look at IoT, we might end up with millions of, you know, uh, thousands of devices in our lives. And some of that has to collapse onto something to make it manageable. Uh, so not clear what that place that it collapses onto is. So, so let, me, let me tee this up, because I, I think that we can connect a couple of pieces together in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the challenge and, and opportunity with 5G is that you might be in a car or in your house and data streaming from your, from your environment um, is all around you, but not going through any connected device. It's not like you plug your phone in and your phone is an aggregation point or your router is an aggregation point. It's very likely that a whole bunch of information is going to the 5G cell phone tower in your neighborhood or in, your, in proximity to where you are at the moment. And then that could become the aggregation point where decision, where all that information is put together around you because it's not even clear right that you're if you're you know that you're in your car at the time or that you're in your house and that your your sprinkler system is interacting with your front door um it it's it's true truly this um much much different model but you then expect all the data to be aggregated in today's data center model and this is what you were talking about all of that information is going to go to a cloud a, a, a cloud somewhere mm -hmm. and People should remember there is no one cloud. So, you know, your, your uh, digital music system might go to Amazon, your, your, your home security might go to Azure, your, um, you know, uh, TV infrastructure might be going to Google, um, you know, who knows where, all carried by the dumb pipes on the telcos who, who seem left holding the bag on this. Um, and that model is, it's already distributed but oh my goodness, the latency of connecting data centers in that type of, of design, that's no, there's, no experience, there's no centralized experience there. That's a mess. Um, I, I absolutely agree. And that's why I, I, I feel very strongly that for edge and IoT and this sort of new world of smart devices and ambient computing, the telecom providers are in a very, very uh, you know, strategic place where their proximity to end users, you know, allows them to actually lead and win this next, uh, you know, turf. Um, and, the, and in fact, it's this, the advantages that the cloud providers have, which is being able to build hyperscale data centers, deploy capital and, you know, uh, massive amounts of capital and build massive computing factories. The, the constraining factor over there is that you're going to put these hyperscale data centers where the number one cost of, uh, you know, of compute is cheap, which is electricity. Flip side, you know, electricity is never cheap in these urban dens and areas. Uh, real estate is also not cheap. And so the telecom operators already have footprint infrastructure and, you know, domain knowledge on how to build and run these very sophisticated uh, infrastructures. They now have the ability to actually, you know, go beyond being dumb pipes because if they can put a platform over there that solves what you very eloquently described as this mix of different types of services and you know connecting thousands of devices all shuttling data to some cloud somewhere instead if they were the ones who provided one virtual cloud across all these services and added value to that stream of data as close as possible to the end user you know it, it, it i think it's a game changer a for the telecom providers because they just become that much more valuable than just providing a fast pipe but b they become the application platform on which these IoT and edge applications will run, much as OTT, you know, has been deployed and has become what it is on, on public cloud. So, all right, I, I want to play devil's advocate because somebody listening to this um, at, at, with a skeptical ear, which I hope everybody does, because um, <laughs> we're talking about the future, uh, is going to say that the 
telcos have not proven themselves capable of building the type of dynamic multi-tenant infrastructure that cloud providers have, right? They, the cloud providers just end run them, you know, just have and so far done an end run around the, the telcos um, in, in delivering these service. What, and, and I'll completely cede the real estate, I'll completely cede the, their, their ability to get networking um, into, the, into these locations and handle it, you know, the, the, the service aspect of, of you know, distributed uh, service. Why do you think they're gonna show up? That's, you know, I'm hoping they show up. Uh, okay. I, I, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, market capitalization to be exploited if they show up. Um, so let's just sort of go back and, you know, play it back why, you know, the sequence of evolution over here. I don't think that the telecom providers could have become cloud providers. One, most telecom providers have always had a very regional remit. There are no global telecom providers, for example. Yes, there are some you know, multinational ones, but largely within each geography or nation, they operate you know, within the laws and regulations of whatever the equivalent of the FCC, et cetera, is over there. Yeah, so, sure. you know, so, so, so to become a global cloud provider, I think that opportunity just wasn't there for them and it didn't make sense. They could at best be you know, a regional cloud provider, and a lot of them did. I mean, there are great examples within each country of you know, these telecom providers trying to provide cloud services. When public cloud came on the horizon, they kind of figured that their value add was somehow tightly integrating their bandwidth along, and network management and security along with their you know, infrastructure and trying to sell that to enterprises. But you know, that's just a stopgap. Uh, ultimately, the, the powerful economics of hyperscale data centers coupled with you know, very rich stacks of functionality that the public cloud providers put together were just very compelling economically, time to market wise, et cetera, that you, know, you started to build the applications over there. So there's no way they compete in that world. And you know, over there, latency really is not a strategic weapon. Proximity is not a strategic weapon because we're largely industrializing client server at very large scale. So the same types of applications that we built on cli client server are the ones that we're building on the public cloud. Uh, and you know, you've got this very strong cloud to uh, client sort of data traffic pattern. And you know, so there's no hope for you as a telecom provider except to just become a dumb bit pipe, albeit a very fast one, and compete on you know, speeds and feeds. Right. It's different but, do, but doing client server in 10,000 data centers is, is impossible. Right. It's, yes. right. It, it, it's not, you, can, you can't, you can't go and say, I've got, you know, 10,000 cities, 10,000 pops. Cause it, we're not talking about a single data center city. We're even talking about multi small data centers within an urban core. Um, right. And, and so from that perspective, you know, you can't, you know, most companies can barely handle us West and us East, let alone, Distributing an application in multiple fault zones, in multiple uh, uh, fault zones, multiple you know, that 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 just doesn't it's hard. Um, let alone and and then people wouldn't pay to have their applications in platforms where they don't need it. Right, part of client servers, you've got resources spun up that the meter is taking on, so you're not going to spin up ten thousand copies of your application infrastructure, uh, and we certainly couldn't couldn't afford it. Um, from a build-out perspective, so we're let, let's let's switch topics a little bit because right this 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 that's not a telecom pipe problem. It's it's actually an architectural ma and app management problem. I agree. I think it's a, it's a data state problem, and you know if you if you looked at it, the evolution of client server itself, I think largely why did we centralize everything in the server because it's easy to program. You know, things when they're centralized, when they're sitting in one place, you can pile all your data in one place and you can slice and dice it. You can do that very efficiently. You can scale out instead of scaling up through some right. of these sort of scale out architectures. But, you know, imagine a parallel universe where client server wasn't a thing and we started with distribution from the get go. And, you know, and, and don't ask me why, just imagine. <laughs> um, I'm looking for an analogy, but yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so imagine that my you know, server solves, yeah. simplifies simplifies something that um, is not going to be usable. In the that's network, right, and, and, and to me, that's a that's a distributed data problem. 
you know, it, the challenge that we have is that, you know, state is very, very challenging. Uh, the minute you have stateful apps, uh, you, you end up essentially having to make compromises on scalability, on, 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 on distribution, uh, because there are very, very hard 50-year-old computer science problems that we don't necessarily have strong answers for. Right. Hyperscale acid, acid, acid being the added for <laughs> Yeah, acid is probably acid is the, the biggest uh, you know, challenge over there, right? And, and one of the interesting things that hyperscale data centers and then web scale applications on them did was it forced us to go and you know, challenge the conventions and ask ourselves, does everything really need to be acid? And the answer was, no, it doesn't need to be acid. We can actually be at sort of the other end of the spectrum and be eventually consistent. And guess what? It does solve a bunch of problems in terms of scaling up or scaling out within the data center. So you, know, you, you, you fast forward from 2005 to 2010, you've had this amazing NoSQL uh, revolution and we've managed to scale databases to levels within the data center that were not possible before. Yep. And that again, plays to the strengths of hyperscale data centers because you can just you know, get more efficiency out of, out, of, out of the infrastructure that you have there. But that still doesn't solve the problem of geo-distributed data centers you know, to the point that if you're a telecom provider, you have 5,000 POPs. How do you string together each POP like it's a part of one coherent database itself and it, you know, looks and behaves and feels like one database that you access and you can write data to one particular pop and it's available in another pop. And you know, you, how do you simplify that? Eventual consistency right. as a model simplified the scale out within the data center, but it did that at the cost of making application writing a lot more complex. So you, know, you, you, you tend to push a lot of the bad answers that you get from eventual consistency into the hands of the programmer and say, you've got to deal with these problems at the application layer. Oh, well, I, I would, so uh, the, the idea of programmers handling this problem is going to be mind-numbing. Right? I, I agree with I, you. I agree with I, you. I really, I really do believe that we're going to have to see some, some platforms that are able to move compute resources. So think of a, of a distributed Kubernetes. It's not yep. even the model. That Kubernetes doesn't build that model per se, it's, but something that would actually move workloads to where compute is needed dynamically based on latency to the client. And then with that data would have to be replicated and synchronized. So as you're driving through a metro area, the data that your, your bundle of data would actually be hopped um, following you through your, right, your journey from that Correct. perspective. And I, completely, I completely agree with you. We're in violent agreement on this fact that you can't take that model and try and generalize it to the edge because the complexity of programming that model just melts everyone's brains. There is not enough uh, brain power and time available to solve <laughs> the problem at the application level. What has to happen is the, the platform has to evolve to solve that problem and hide, and, you know, hide, all, the hide all the complexity, abstract away all the complexity. So from a programmatic standpoint, anyone can write an edge application Anyone should be able to write a distributed systems application, which today, by the way, is just a, you know, a very select niche and very expensive skill set. But you know, how do you generalize that so that anyone can write a distributed application without actually knowing anything about distributed systems? I, I'm, I'm having Erlang flashbacks right now. This is what <laughs> Erlang was built for, um, the language Erlang. Um, was yep. this, this sort of problem. But I mean, and this is where actually the telcos um, you know, as much as as much as we're we're, we're subtly, you know, I'm, I'm subtly dissing their their ability to get get in front of this development platform um, phase. They're actually able, when cell phone technology, to hand off calls between cell towers and do exactly the type of work that you and I are describing for a data stream, uh, yeah. aka a cell phone call. Um, but they don't follow that model for actual data for application and compute. That's a new, that would be a different thing. Yeah, and I, I, and I don't know whether, you know, the data stream of voice uh, can port over to a data stream of an application. Yes, it can in, in, the, in, in, in respect of things like TCP IP, et cetera. And I think that that's sort of the, uh, the problem that needs to get a lot, uh, unlocked as, at the, the 60,000 foot level. But you know, if you sort of drill down 
I think there are two or three pieces that come together to solve this data of the edge distributed systems and how do you make it stupid simple for people to write apps to it. You know, you, you start with a distributed data problem and you guys interviewed uh, folks from Redis Lab, I think a few. A few Dave Nelson, that. that's right. Yeah, and I thought it was a fascinating discussion. You know, I, I think they're starting to do one aspect of that, which is pushing caching to the edge. You know, and caching is sort of an intermediary uh, state. Uh, you know, you're not full, putting a full database there. You're trying to provide proximity and the ability to take maybe certain types of transient data that need fast response and just, you know, purpose specific provide a set of APIs to do that. I think that's a great place to start. But, you know, the bigger question is, can we generalize a database uh, to actually live and work at the edge and provide full distributed, uh, geo-distributed synchronization with somewhat asset-like guarantees, not necessarily all of them, but somewhat asset-like guarantees. Uh, but more importantly, can we do it in such a way that the programming interface doesn't change, that you're not asking to, you know, to use your Erlang as an example, you're not asking the world to now stop doing things the way it did and go and learn the actor pattern and learn to think in actors <laughs> just because they need to write a distributed system. You know? uh, and I, I think that's a really important part of the problem. And, you know, uh, shameless plug over here. What we're doing at Macrometa is sort of solving or working towards solving that particular problem. How do you solve the distributed data problem at very large scales in almost an unbounded network where you can have an arbitrary number of nodes? But how do you, you know, you create a distributed database across that that looks and feels like any other database and you don't need to learn about geo-distributed systems and, and distributed programming to program it. So that's one part of what we're trying to solve. So that's only one part, that's the data layer. On top of that, then you have your, you know, your code, your application logic. And I think there are better answers over there that come from the, you know, the, the container world, for example. I think we've learned now uh, through microservices architectures and patterns to decompose our applications from big fat monoliths down to you know, very, very meaningful you know, focused components that can be scaled up and scaled down that can also be mobile because these are largely stateless. They're just executing some logic where the state is in some other layer. So they can be moved wherever you need to move them. Now there are other higher order problems of being able to manage them at the scale of you know, a, an edge network with 5,000 you know, potential micro data centers versus you know, a few regions. But at least those answers are a lot more clear than the database piece of it. And then the third thing to do, I think, and this is where I think the telecom operators also have some answers. You know, if a telecom operator built a platform like this, which had a distributed database that made everything look like it was one centralized logical database, not necessarily physically centralized, just logically it looks like it's centralized. You had a container platform on top of that that you could, you know, deploy your containers in and run your app. The third question becomes then how do you solve this, uh, you know, regional issue that most telecom operators are regional, right. but I think they've already solved that. I mean, if you look at it, you can basically go to any country, turn your cell phone on, and get voice and data over there because they have roaming agreements and you know there there's a lot of standardization at the interfaces levels and you know we, we, the SMA has made that possible. What we that need is a sort a, of a, that took a long time. That was not a fast. It might not have been fast. You. Yeah, it might not have been fast, but you know the point is it's possible. And it possible. throwing these sorts of you know regional clouds into a global cloud is not as big a leap as trying to peer voice across disparate networks and systems because the, you know, so, 20 years later, right, we've got a lot of standardization across. So let me, let me, let me play this back for you. Cause I have, I have a question, it, sure. um, but, but, but I want to frame it a little bit. Okay. So the idea here is that you've got a, this distributed data application where, where your data is, is able to be synchronized and moved and, and, and maybe could follow you, you know, across, you know, replicated across hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, on top of that, you have stateless compute, you know, microservices that basically follows you. So you could say, "Oh, I'm running these ten, just like apps on your phone." I can, I can imagine apps, you know, in the the, the edge infrastructure. I'll resist mm -hmm. calling it cloud infrastructure. The edge, the distributed edge infrastructure, and you have a set of services that sort of everywhere you go. Um, you know, follow you like this this flock of flock of sheep. Sure. Um, so your your data is their grass, and uh, I'm not going to extend that analogy. Uh, <laughs> and and so I, you can easily imagine this sort of getting built up, and in a kumbaya um, 
cloud world, uh, telecom world, that you know those those that those environments can be passed from provider to provider in a in a billable way. The the question I get into is is that a multi tenant environment? How do you right? Because we're not talking about my apps. I'm talking about vendored, you know, a hundred vendors of different you know container services that then need to come into a shared data model. And am I am I getting too wound up in in this? you know, sort of uh, very ecosystem, multi-vendor ecosystem, or am I just going to have to get it all from AT&T? That's a great question. Uh, I think it's, a, it's actually a very deep question. Um, so if you look at telecom operators, it's inherently, I'd say there are, there are facets of multi-tenancy built into their infrastructure anyway. Uh, they're obviously able to do multi-tenancy at scales that, that are quite ridiculous. The challenge though is maybe the interrupt between different telecom vendors you know, is, is problematic. Um, and because now there's also a data and a platform there, largely they've just been you know, sending bits on their pipe. I don't think that there is necessarily a clear understanding at their end what it takes to actually host data and, and run apps uh, beyond sort of things that were very deeply embedded in the telecom networks itself, this is far more general purpose. And I, I, I don't know if they're even thinking about sort of interoperability, especially across multiple tenants at that level. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just don't know if I, I even have an answer for you on that one. But I think it's the right question to ask because it's a big hill. That needs well, to be what, I, what I like about the way you're approaching this, because it has me thinking about, you know, and, and the hot topic du jour is, right, uh, companies using a lot, having a lot, access to a lot more data than you realize and they're owning it and not the individual. Um, in, in the cases you're describing, we're, we're, we've got a whole bunch of sources of data that need to get aggregated somewhere because I have an application that needs, you know, data from five or six different sources related to me that's currently being sort of, because of the client server model, being smeared into databases across the planet, um, none of them local and, and none of them easily shareable. Would, do you think that we're gonna have to sort of flip this model so that my, my data and the, the aggregate data is then closer, in closer proximity to me so everybody can sort of connect into it? Is that, I mean, that's a very big change in, in model. I almost feel like you're asking me to talk about blockchain, which I, I don't want to, but <laughs> so I'll, uh, so I, I think that's interesting a, that you went there. That's a, that's a <laughs> potential way to look at blockchain. It's true. I, I think it certainly is a potential way to look at blockchain because probably blockchain today has some of the most interesting answers to a way for people to own their own data. Uh, but also at the same time, Blockchain is like programming in assembly language today versus, you know, uh, if you want to do anything meaningful in blockchain and write rich applications, it's just very, very hard to do. And, you know, you've got the edge as well with the same set of problems. Uh, I, I, they probably end up converging at some point in the future, uh, not anytime soon. But when it does, it puts, I think, the network operators in a very powerful position where they can become the uh, the intermediary, the trustee of, uh, you know, of consumers, for example, to host their data and make it shareable among different types of OTT providers, et cetera, down the road. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting work going on over there around anonymization and encryption of data and somehow being able to present data in an encrypted form to the compute layer so that the compute layer can be provided by a different service provider and you know, without actually knowing what the you know what the data is, they can compute on top of it. And there's some work done at MIT that 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 sort of is very early in this area. But I think it's sort of that that converges out 15, 10, 15 years out. It's not a it's not something that I see happening now over the next few years, just given the relative immaturity of both sides of this conversation, the edge as well as uh, blockchain. But certainly, wow. I think there's a there, there's a glimmer over there that that's that's possibly how it gets solved. Um, but, you know, so maybe it's just more simplistically speaking, if telecom operators and maybe, you know, we can take AT&T or Verizon as, as good examples because they do have large data center operations. 
what if these guys just provided a cloud that was very much driven towards machine to machine type applications and it had the kind of architectural constructs that we've been talking about, a distributed data layer that simplified state management immensely, that provided centralization as a logical feature, not, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it, the whole database is programmable as one, even though it's running on 5,000, 10,000 different locations. You have this follow me data capability where data moved uh, to wherever it needed to be consumed. And then you had a, a, you know, a, program, a programmable layer on top of that, that might be containers, it might be microservices, might be something uh, you know, evolved from their nano services, something like that, uh, where your logic could then execute just in time. It would get invoked you know, when an incoming request came, it could be invoked in microseconds, it could process, it could change state in the database and then it could, you know, uh, it could be terminated and then you could pick that off at a different point. If, if you just so, did that, something yeah. close to server, something what you're describing is something in between containers and serverless, but basically very dynamic, uh, portable compute infrastructure. Exactly, and I think serverless is a very good manifestation of that. It, 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 it you know, it, it puts many of those principles in action. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many other pieces of it that's that that are still yet to come, but you know, it, that's an exciting and probably a topic well worth its own discussion. But if you just did that, my point being, now you've actually created a, a probably a far more interesting platform that would attract app developers to come and build apps and deploy them on these telecom networks instead of going to the central clouds. Uh, because again, the central clouds don't have this proximity advantage. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of machine to machine type use cases where proximity and low latency and being able to uh, operate on fast data streams in real time is a real necessity. And this is not a better, faster, cheaper play. This is you know, sort of horizontal scaling. This is the next type of apps that we can conceive of because we've never had these platforms to, you know, to build applications on. When we built, sorry. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, I, it, there, I, I believe you know, for the reasons you outlined, cheaper will cloud, hyperscale clouds are gonna remain, become our cheapest, you know, burst elastic compute infrastructure. Yeah. Um, you know, as an aside, right, back end, we believe that, you know, you can own, if you have persistent workloads, owning a machine is, is going to be cheaper than renting a machine. That, that's a uh, gratuitous plug, I'll move on. But um, <laughs> the, the idea here, you know, edge, edge compute infrastructure is going to be more expensive. It, you're going to use it because it has a different advantage for you. Yep. Um, right, because of latency, proximity, maybe access to data, that you can't afford to ship into the cloud, um, or you know, for, for there, there's there. I think there will be reasons besides it's cheaper. Um, yeah, you, you. I think you. You know, if you look at enterprises, it's very hard to quantify the strategic advantage of uh, information, especially uh, information mm -hmm. that has temporal value, i.e., degrades over time. So, if you need to act on, for example, a fraud. Uh, type transaction, the quicker you can act on it and the quicker then you can react at a larger scale because maybe that fraud is being perpetuated, you know, across the network, you've got a big advantage. You save money uh, from, you know, right. getting losses. Those classes of applications today are just, you know, the cloud's too far away for. Them. And there's, there's a lots of those types of new applications. And I can't even imagine the new kinds of things that are possible then, you know, if you have those capabilities. Uh, you know, certainly I think when, if you go back to the early days of the web, you know, we could never imagine an application like Facebook or, or an application like, you know, WhatsApp. Uh, those are all brand new, uh, higher order, uh, you know, functionalities that these building blocks and these very generic programming platforms allowed us to conceive and build. The IoT edge is so primitive today that you can't even think of these applications because we're still very much, you know, uh, stuck in the world of just trying to figure out how to program a device uh, and maybe generalize enough of it that we can program a class of devices now. Right. I, and I, I think that that's a great, you know, when, when you start thinking about voice and video analytics, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're only at the, at the beginning of, of data sensor information, right? You know, I can easily see um, buildings where you actually can have a 3D grid and you can track people in three-dimensional space mm -hmm. walking through the building or moving in the building. Um, you know, in a store being, you know, a classic one where we're actually detecting if people pick items up and, and you know, and, and buy them uh, without, without the, 
needing to go to a cash register for that counting action. Right. Um, but so you said something that I want to I want to drill into, and then I, I know we need to be careful on time. Um, this is so much fun. Um, <laughs> where first applications, right? It's easy, it's fun to talk about all these big, you know, uh, consumer type applications and AR, VR, and things like that. But it's very clear that the the machine to machine, the business side of this, is going to be a much faster mover because of the way the footprints and the value propositions go. Can you talk a little bit about where you see these first movers coming in? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's sort of, the, the challenge we have with some of the IoT edge stuff is I think there's a whole bunch of emerging applications. It's very hard to understand what's here and now that customers have enough pain that they'll put money to solve right now. And probably the one that I can point to over there is just sort of preventive uh, you know, preventive, uh, predictive type applications where if you can look at a stream of data and you can prevent something that you don't want from happening because it's expensive, uh, or you can predict when something needs to be changed and replaced, uh, and, and that ends up becoming just a better user experience for end customers, that's sort of where it's coming out. And you can clearly see that, you know, in a lot of situations, the companies might actually have devices, et cetera, that are, you know, that might have the ability to collect data, but there's actually no way to take that data, put it in some place where you can analyze it and do that. You know, for example, if you're, you know, if you're a dishwasher company and you're making dishwashers, uh, if your dishwasher could basically talk back, I think there's lots of interesting things you could do. You could actually change your business model overall. You could get into dishwashing as a service. You could charge by the plate, by the cup, by the spoon, so on and so forth. Um, right. Uh, yes. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I say that in somewhat. No, you know, this is, you're, you're actually, that's, that's truly yeah. legitimate. I had a, I had a friend who was just telling they you know, um, they don't have internet at their house Yeah. and yet they called up service on their washing machine yeah. and the service company was able to diagnose and fix the problem over the phone, which meant there is a 4g internet connection in that dishwasher. Right. There's so a SIM they, card in there and you know, yep. It's got a TCP IP, it's got an IP address and that makes it, you know, so you can imagine the, the scale at which, you know, a Whirlpool or a Bosch or whoever does this, that could be a huge cost compression for them. It could, you know, it could change the way that they organize and react to, for example, a systemic problem. Maybe there's a faulty part and they need to do a recall. And, you know, there's just so many sort of second order, third order benefits that you get from having access to that data. So I think that what, what, I, what I see in the market today is that there's a, there's a big desire on the part of a lot of these companies to really try and get into prediction and, you know, uh, and uh, basically avoid uh, situations from happening. And that's probably where the early market is. Um, and then subsequently, you get into far more interesting uh, types of use cases with autonomous driving platforms, et cetera, where you know, the platform itself can probably drive the car, but if you go one level higher and you start to ask yourself, how do I coordinate and orchestrate across cars, across a transportation network? Uh, and then, you know, you plug that into uh, sensors that might be in the, you know, in the roadworks themselves, et cetera. Uh, you know, you end up with just a, a, a phenomenal amount of rich data that you can then build some, you know, crazy types of solutions for. Um, you know, uh, so th those are sort of emerging platforms and there's a lot of coordination required between different types of products and technologies and platforms themselves. And maybe that takes a longer time. Uh, but certainly in, in this immediate horizon of three to five years, you know, you're, you're, you're going to see a lot more of these consumer devices uh, be accessible, programmable, serviceable over the wire rather than, uh, you know, uh, rather than the old, old way of, you know, doing things, which is you had a repairman come in you know, open things up. So, uh, Chathan, I'm so, uh, this is Stephen again coming back on. I always watch the time, so I apologize. Sure. No, uh, no. So I, I wanted to wrap things up and highlight for our readers, I, um, some of your posts, my, my favorite one is the over-the-top posts on, okay. on, on LinkedIn with uh, Sylvester Salone. It's a great post. I'll be uh, putting that link up on, um, on the blog when we post it. For our listeners, though, um, I th it's in LinkedIn. Do they just search your name to find the yeah. article? Is yes, if they search for my name. It's also on Medium, and I'm, I can shoot you a, a link to the Medium article. 
okay. uh, the post. Uh, that's probably easier than LinkedIn, but you know, uh, feel free to uh, link me up on LinkedIn. Uh, and um, you know, I, I, I try and blog as regularly as possible. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. It's a great learning opportunity. Great. Well, thanks again for uh, joining us today. This was a really good edge discussion. I know, Rob, I think this may be one of our better edge discussions and uh, certainly went into a lot of different topics and where the market's going. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And Rob, thanks for joining as well. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Rob and Stephen. This was, this was the highlight of my week. I don't think I can top it this week. It's still Monday. Oh so. my gosh. That's scary. <laughs> I, I love going, going super deep on these architectural issues. You're thinking about it. Um, and that's right. This is, this is what we need to have discussions about because this is how you shape things. Can't, it, it's, not, it's not just going to form fully hatched. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, um, it's going to be, uh, yeah, I'm a big, uh, uh, I, I, you know, evolutionary programming, right. Where you use genetic algorithms, et cetera. Largely I look at almost every new market opportunity as this big search space. And, you know, you have companies form, which are like these little tiny organisms that then need to mutate and evolve more and more functionality. And at some point these organisms combine and become a, you know, a, a super organism and so on and so forth. You, you kind of see the same thing happening almost in every tech space, right? Uh, everyone's searching to find the, you know, the, the, the maxima, the global maxima. Uh, and the global maxima is what creates functionality and value for everyone. Uh, but there's lots of little local maximas in the, in, in the journey. And hopefully you don't get stuck in one of them. That, that's, that's all you <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true AI person. Well, well so thanks again. And of course, when your company comes out of stealth mode, unless it's directly attacking uh, where we work, um, we're happy to help promote that as well. Oh, we so, love it. It's crazy let, enough. I'm in our let, space. Yeah, let's stay in touch. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Jason, thank you. Bye bye.